Hello, my friends, and welcome back to the channel. I'm really excited to let you know today is a very special day, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later on in this video. But for now, I just want to say that I know a lot of people get really, really frustrated with CSS, and that's because it is kind of hard. It, it tricks us into thinking it's a very simple language early on. We start learning the very basics of it, but then we run into a bit of a wall with it sometimes. And this video, I just want to talk to you about how we can sort of go backwards a little bit so we can actually move forwards more and write CSS with a lot more confidence. CSS is hard because we don't have total control over the output. We have to tell the browser our intended output, and then depending on a ton of variables, it gives the user the best it can. Think of it, we don't know what device the users are on. They can have different screen sizes, resolutions, orientations, different color gamuts, different input devices, different browsers, different browser settings, different operating systems, and more. With all that in play, we can't have total control over the output. The user does. Other languages, like JavaScript, work more in absolutes. You tell it to do something, and it does that. Or, of course, it fails. CSS doesn't fail. If the browser doesn't understand a line of code, it just skips it and it keeps on going with the rest of it. As Robin Rendell put it in a response to a tweet of mine a while back, this is probably one of the reasons a lot of people coming from a computer science background don't like CSS. When they're writing it, they have to face the webbiness of the web. You know, you have to face all these unknown variables and all of that. And how can we possibly keep up with all of these unknowns and all of these variables? Well, part of it is anticipating them. We know people will use small screens and large screens and everything in between. So we need to test small screens, large screens, and everything in between. Another thing is avoiding absolutes. If I declare width 1000 pixels on a container, it's locked in. If the screen is smaller than that, it's going to overflow and cause horizontal scrolling. Instead of that, I might use a percentage, say 90% with a margin left and a margin right of auto to keep it in the middle. Now I know that my container can grow and shrink with the device. Then when I'm testing, I realize that at large screens, maybe the container is actually too big. So then I can come in and set a max width and solve that issue as well. Now, anticipating all these things, that can be really hard at first, especially when we don't know all the tools that we have at our disposal. But that's just like JavaScript can be hard when we don't know how to write a loop. CSS is the same. It becomes hard to solve specific problems when we don't know all the tools that we have at our disposal. When we're writing CSS, sometimes we run into an issue. For simplicity's sake, let's stick with that width 1000 pixels. When we realize we can't do that because on many screens it will cause horizontal scrolling, and well that sucks, so we switched our width to 90% and it fixes that issue, but then we have a new one where the div gets too wide on large screens, so then you come in with the max width like we mentioned before. The problem when you're layering things on like this, sometimes there's a right way of doing it, but sometimes it just becomes band-aids on top of band-aids on top of band-aids. We're just applying fix on top of fix in order to try and stop the bleeding, but that's when the band-aids actually start getting in each other's way, causing new problems. That's why we have the whole Peter Griffin meme, right? Where he's pulling on the blinds and it's just, it's this trap where we get of putting band-aids on top of band-aids. We've all been there cursing when you're sure you finally fixed the issue only to find out it actually caused a bigger problem. Usually, the best way to avoid this type of situation is to plan things out before writing a single line of code. Look at the design that you're trying to accomplish and think about what parts are moving around, how they're going to need to move. And the more practice you get and the more situations you run into while you're doing all this, the more you'll be able to anticipate these problems before they happen. There's really no magic bullet here either. It takes work and effort and experience but it also takes a good understanding of the problem itself. And I think a lot of people don't stop to think about what's going wrong, or more importantly, why it's going wrong. When a problem happens, you might not know the best solution, but before adding a band-aid on top of a band-aid on top of a band-aid, stop and think about why. Why is the issue happening in the first place? Is something not adapting to the screen properly? Why not? What did you try? Why didn't that work? Work backwards and try and analyze the situation. See if you can think of a new way to approach it or research a new way and see how another site does it. Piling band-aids on top of each other can work in the short term, but it doesn't actually stop the bleeding. It just hides it away somewhere. It doesn't help you come up with a solution you can use in the future. And it doesn't help you when you need to make another small change or a small tweak or something like that. And then everything is so locked in that you have no idea what to do next. Now, maybe you're going, Kevin, I already know this. I know that my solution's not working. I just have no idea to fix it. And going back to square one, that doesn't help because I don't know what to do. I mean, if you already had a better solution, you'd probably be using it already, right? When you're in a pinch, places like Stack Overflow can really help you out. But one of the problems I have with them is they rarely look at problems in context. 
for other languages like JavaScript, they, they often work fine because JavaScript, like most programming languages, doesn't do well in the global scope. We try and scope things to as small as possible, which helps prevent problems. There's no leakage going on. With CSS, there's so many variables of play, there's the global nature of it, and there's a lot going on that is very different from other situations. So sometimes sites like Stack Overflow, you find an answer and it just doesn't work for you because it's different to the context they were in compared to your own. So what can we do? Well, we need to give CSS the respect that it deserves and go beyond the basics of the syntax and understand CSS and understand how CSS really works. And of course, we need to figure out how to figure all this out in the first place. The first thing to do is to stop letting CSS trick us into thinking it's a simple language. And we need to understand what causes it to render the way it does on a page. To do that, we need to learn the properties that we have to help us control the layout and the impact those have on the page layout. It's more than just saying display flex makes columns or display grid is good for two dimensional layouts. We really need to understand what happens when we do display flex. How is that different from the normal normal flow and what are the implications of that because when you do it sometimes there's unintended consequences that happen with it. The more we understand these fundamentals of CSS, it simplifies our questions when we run into problems. If I'm trying to use Flexbox for a layout and it's causing an issue, I can isolate that one problem, research that one property that isn't acting the way I think it should, and I can probably find a solution. That's much better than not really understanding how to position something on a page, combining floats with positioning, and then trying to add Flexbox on top of it when the other things are sort of not working, it just becomes band-aids on top of band-aids on top of band-aids. And the nice thing is, once you really start understanding how CSS is meant to work, then you start unlocking more and more of it you start to be able to anticipate how it's going to work. You know what you need to do to achieve a specific layout and you can predict how it will render across all the different screen sizes and devices and browsers. Even better, once we understand CSS at a deep level, when a problem does come up, you'll be able to find a solution to it so much faster. You'll start knowing where to look when problems come up or often you'll actually know the reason before you even have to look at it and you'll have a solution in mind. You won't have to research it. It's just gonna be like, oh, that's weird. Oh, I know why that happened. And then you're gonna know what to do. It's it's incredible. And I I remember when this started happening to me and I started coming up with my own solutions to problems, it's just such a wonderful feeling. When we learn CSS, we often learn the very foundations early on. We assume we know them and then we keep moving forward. And then we get mad at CSS because it doesn't work the way we think it should. But that's because we only know the fundamentals exist instead of knowing how they work. And that's why I've created CSS Demystified. It's a course that deep dives how CSS works. The first two weeks are devoted to the simple fundamentals. But instead of looking at the basics of how they work, I look at the implications they have on how we write our code. In CSS Demystified, I break it all down, going over the mistakes I see people making early on. And then from there, we slowly work our way up to more advanced approaches where we're taking advantage of how CSS works to write clean, functional, and easy to maintain CSS. CSS is something that we can write with confidence. There is a logic behind it and it can make sense. It's different from other languages, but if we embrace how it's meant to work instead of fighting against it, we start to have a much better time with it. So if you would like to check out the course, the link to it is just down below and you can check it out and see what it's all about. And of course, if that's not for you, just stick around here on my channel and have fun. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do consider subscribing because this channel is all about CSS, having fun with it, learning as much as we can and really understanding it so we can not only be less frustrated with it, but to start to fall in love with it and really enjoy writing it.